Okay, so let's talk about methods to detect and measure bacterial growth. Now, most of these um, you're eventually going to talk about in lab as well. But since we're focusing on bacterial growth, I think that it's good if people have some knowledge of uh, the various ways that we detect growth in the lab and what those methods are good for. So, uh, the first sort of scheme that you can use to detect growth in the lab is direct measurements. Um, so direct cell counts, and uh, which you can do using a microscope, or you can do using a cell counting instrument. So a direct microscope count means kind of what it says. You take your bacteria, you put it on a microscope, and you count how many cells that you see. And that's how many cells that you have. And if you know how much you put on it, then you know how many cells that you have per how much you put on it. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated than that because you typically don't want to count all of the cells that you put on a slide. That could be thousands of cells easily. So typically, you use a, um, uh, a special type of slide. Uh, called a counting chamber uh, or a hemocytometer. So um, this is a picture of a hemocytometer here, um, which is more properly used for counting red blood cells, but also works for counting bacteria. And the idea is that the, um, the base of the slide uh, takes a standard amount of liquid and um, when you zoom in with the microscope you'll see it's divided into these squares and each square is a uh, specific area and you count how many bacteria are in one square and then you maybe do that for like two or three squares and you can get a number of bacteria per um, per square and you know how much fluid it takes to, uh, uh, to cover one square because it's something you can look up as a part of the counting chamber. Um, and that will give you your microbe concentration. Uh, that is like fast in and cheap in that all you have to have is a microscope and uh, one of these special counting chamber slides. Um, but it is also tedious and time consuming in that, like, while it might be fast in that it doesn't take like days to grow the bacteria, um, it does take a lot of, like, you have to sit there counting it. Or, more likely, you have to hire somebody to sit there counting it. Um, and so that can get expensive over the long term. There are also direct cell counting instruments, um, most particularly a um, Coulter counter and flow cytometer. Um, Coulter counters are more specifically for detecting and counting bacteria and microbes, whereas flow cytometers can are kind of like multi-purpose for counting stuff in um, solution, usually many different types of, of cells and can distinguish between different types of cells and things like that. Um, but both of them basically work off of a similar method, which is that you have a specific volume that goes into them, and uh, that volume narrows down to a width whereby you get like one cell passing at a time, and uh, for a Coulter counter, it's usually going to um, have an electronic detector, which is going to detect like either charge um, uh, the, the, usually the conductance of, um, the cells as they pass through, 
because the conductance of a cell is going to be different from the conductance of water, so it can count how many cells pass past it. And with a flow cytometer, it's usually going to be measuring like fluorescence. So you fluorescently label the cells that you want it to to see, and then like when it sees a fluorescent tag pass it, it counts one. Um, in both cases, these are like automated, so they take a fair amount of time, um, but you don't have to be there for that time. They're also kind of expensive pieces of equipment, particularly flow cytometers, uh, but they are uh, going to give you a much more accurate cell count. Now, direct cell counts all have a certain uh, disadvantage, which is that you're just counting cells. You don't know whether or not those cells are alive. Um, and you also don't know how many cells there are in a clump, right? So we talked about cell arrangements. You know that sometimes cells are hooked to each other. Well, how does a... And this is going to be particularly true of the automated ones. Like if you have a, you know, undergrad student worker or something like that looking through a microscope, they can at least usually figure out what's one cell and what's two cells. But uh, one of these automatic detectors can't really tell the difference between one long cell and two short cells hooked together. So um, what you're going to get is like the number of total cells living and dead, and it'll probably more likely be the number of cell clusters or connected cell units, especially if you're using an automatic counter. Um, there are a few ways to mitigate that. Uh, you can use, if you're doing flow cytometry, there's special uh, dyes that will only stain living cells or will stain living and dead cells separately. And so you could use that as, a, uh, as your fluorescent tag for, um, for your cells and like only get living cells, but it's still not perfect for that sort of application. So, second, we have viable cell counts. Viable cell counts uh, only count living cells, and they do so basically by you take your, um, you have like a plate, uh, with some media on it, and you put a certain amount of your bacterial containing media, like a drop or something like that onto there, and then sluice it around. And then you look to see how many colonies you get. And every colony is descended from a cell we're actually going to put a little bit of juice onto exactly what we mean by that in just a second, but a cell that landed at a particular point on the, uh, on the slide and then grew up into a colony. So it has to be alive in order to actually grow into a colony. There are um, advantages and disadvantages to this. A uh, major advantage is, well, it's going to tell you how many living cells that you have, which is usually what you care about. You usually don't care exactly how many dead cells there are. Um, secondly, it's usually really cheap. Uh, it's very, very easy and cheap to grow bacterial cells. Uh, most bacterial growth medias are pretty cheap and uh, the cells kind of grow by themselves. So um, it's nice and inexpensive, fairly high volume. Uh, third, so 
if you want to only look at a particular type of cell, um, say you're looking at uh, drinking water and you want to know how many fecal coliforms, um, which are bacteria that get into the water supply from, you know, fecal contamination, are in it. This is a way that you usually measure how clean your water is. Well, you don't care about the total number of bacteria or even the total number of living bacteria. All you really care about is the bacteria that come from poop. And there are media that are selective for fecal coliforms. And so you could grow it on that and then you only have to worry about the fecal coliforms. You could also use differential media um, to only count a particular species. Now, the disadvantages of this. First off, you don't know how dilute or how many bacteria are in your sample before you do the test. So what if there's a bunch of bacteria in there? Well, then you wouldn't get individual colonies. You just get a whole lawn growing. Um, or if there's too few, you might not get any colonies. So in order to do um, a viable cell count or a plate count, uh, you usually have to do a dilution series, which means you start off with your original culture and then you dilute it usually tenfold at each step and then you're going to plate them all and then you're going to pick the plate that has a reasonable number of colonies on it, right? You want it to be few enough colonies that they are um, easily distinguishable from one another. You can tell where one colony begins and the other one ends. And uh, you usually want less than 300 colonies total. Usually it's nice if they're less than 100 because counting 300 colonies on a plate or more gets very, very tedious. And it's very easy to screw it up um, to like accidentally count one colony more than once or to skip colonies. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just it's an annoying, time-consuming thing to count. Uh, if you don't have an automatic colony counter, which they do make, but which are not perfect. Um, the second problem is not all cells are culturable in the lab. In fact, most environmental bacteria don't grow very well in a lab at all. So if you're looking for bacterial, say, algae samples from a lake water, they can be very, very difficult to grow in a lab, and therefore this isn't going to be a great method for counting them. Third, while we are only measuring um, living cells, because in order to form a colony, you have to be a living cells, Technically, what we're counting here is not individual cells. What we are counting is, oops. So, CFUs stands for colony forming units. And so a colony forming unit is, well, anything that forms a colony, which means it has to be capable of growth and reproduction. And it means that, you know, sometimes you might have, for instance, uh, a strep, say you, say you have a strep or a chain of bacteria and you put them on your plate well the strep of connected bacteria are all going to land in one spot 
And so actually when we say that all uh, the bacteria in a calling air clonal, that's true because all of the bacteria in this chain are clonal. They're all descended from the same cell. Well, they didn't necessarily land as a single cell. They might have landed as a unit of cells stuck together. And that is still going to grow as one colony and would count as one colony forming unit. Um, there can also be some cells that don't grow. Maybe it is a, uh, a, a cell type that is culturable in the lab that you're looking for, but sometimes we have what are called viable but non-culturable cells. This is a dormant state that bacteria enter into, especially when um, nutrients are particularly low. And uh, these viable but non-culturable bacteria, well, they don't grow colonies, so you won't see them. So those are the advantages and disadvantages of plate counts. Um, just to reiterate, advantage is um, you only see, you know, living cells. Um, it's relatively cheap, and uh, it you can use selective and differential media. Disadvantages are it can be time consuming and tedious to count all the colonies. You're actually counting CFUs and not individual cells. Um, and depending upon the bacteria that you're working with, um, they may not culture in the lab at all. And if they do culture, they're going to take some time to grow a colony. This is going to take at least overnight. So it's not going to be the fastest way if you need immediate results. There are two general ways that you can do uh, plate counts, uh, the spread plate method and the pour plate method. Uh, they're both pretty similar. With the spread plate method, you are um, just taking a pre-made plate and then you're pouring your bacteria on top of it and spreading it evenly around the plate, hence spread plate. With the pour plate method, you have liquid melted auger that has been cooled down to the point where it's not going to kill your bacteria. You mix your bacteria in with it, stir it around a little bit, and then pour them in so that the bacteria are actually embedded in the auger. This is going to be better for bacteria that um, uh, don't want to be in oxygenated environments. Um, so they're going to grow better by via the pour plate method. It gives you um, kind of more volume to work with because you're not just working with the surface. And um, yeah, this is just some bacteria that it works better for. Uh, for m most bacteria that you're going to work with in the lab, the spread plate method is just easier and faster and is the one that most people do. Okay, so we talked about doing a dilution series, right? If you've got too much bacteria, you would have to dilute, 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 and dilute um, until you get few enough colonies on your plate that you can count them. But if you're looking at environmental sources, like for, say, looking at fecal coliforms in drinking water, well, hopefully there isn't enough in there that you would need to dilute. And, in fact, there should only be a few per, you know, milliliter or less. Um, and so with, if you're doing, say, counts on drinking water or something like that, you run the risk of, you could sample like five different drinking wells um, and not see any results in any of them. Does that mean that there's zero bacteria present? No, it just means that there isn't at least one bacteria in the sample size that you're looking at. So you need to have a way to concentrate the bacteria as well. With this, the membrane filtration method, what you do is you take a large volume of water, 
much larger than you would normally put on a plate, like say a liter. And you pass that water through a membrane, a filter, all of the bacteria in that liter of water get stuck on the, uh, on the membrane, and then you take the membrane. They actually make some membranes that you can just directly grow off of, but often what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your membrane and then just like put it on a plate and let it grow. Um, and the bacteria will basically grow between the, uh, the plate and the membrane, and then you can count the number of colonies that formed and that's the number of bacteria that were in that entire liter of water. So, uh, those are basically um, two main, the two main counting methods that are used, right? So direct cell counts, you look at cells or you have a device that looks at cells and viable cell counts where you look at colonies um, that have been grown from either diluted or concentrated samples. There are also a number of other ways. Um, one is the most probable number, or MPN. This is a statistical method that gives an estimated cell count using a dilution series um, you have like a set of tubes that are incubated and then you look to see in which one uh, you have um, either a pH change or a gas change that changes the media um, or makes a bubble inside of a thing in, in the liquid. And um, by looking at different dilutions and comparing numbers on a chart, you can get a rough estimate, which is the most probable number of cells in a 100 milliliter sample. Um, and uh, this is like a fast and ready, cheap, easily available method to do estimated cell counting um, that's very standardized. Uh, but the number that it gives is not always as accurate as it could be. It is an estimate. Um, so for a lot of circumstances, this actually isn't used super often anymore. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a statistical estimation method. You can also measure um, the amount of bacteria by just like measuring the amount of bacteria in sort of the way that, you know, if I wanted to know how much how many how much rice was in a uh, a pack of rice I wouldn't go through and count each individual grain of rice I might just want to say there's like a kilogram of rice or there's 500 grams of rice in this sample uh, just a bulk measurement um, so Bulk measurement is, generally speaking, you're measuring biomass, how much cell stuff is there. Uh, the most common way to do this is measuring turbidity. This only works if you're growing bacteria in liquid media, and you also have to be growing them in a way that will disperse them throughout the media. So usually that means you're growing them while shaking. Uh, not you're not shaking you're shaking the bacteria um and uh what turbidity means is cloudiness so the more bacteria there are floating around in the water the more um cloudy the water looks the more uh, light is refracted or bounced away um and uh this is very very fast to measure you can do it in like a minute or less. Um, if you have a spectrophotometer, it's very cheap and easy to do. And spectrophotometers are like not super expensive equipment. Um, so it's, it's most labs are going to have one. Um, so this is this is like the industry standard. I just need a guess and check of how many bacteria are there. I'm going to go measure it on the on the spec. 
and uh, take a look at the turbidity. The problems with this method are, first off, it doesn't distinguish between living and dead cells. Secondly, um, it's only usable on things that you're growing in this specific way. And this is the most common way to culture bacteria in the lab, is in liquid form and, and shaking it. But, uh, but yeah. Um, it also only works with concentrated samples that aren't too concentrated. So that's a problem. If uh, the tur turbidity isn't high enough, like let's say you only had a eh, 1,000 cells in this, it would look basically clear. Right? So you have to have a pretty high number of cells before you can get any sort of reading. But if the cell count gets too high, then you're already basically blocking out all of the light. And then adding more cells doesn't make it any more accurate. So it only works in this sort of Goldilocks zone of you have to have a pretty high amount of cells, but not too high amount of cells. Um, and you can do a dilution series if you have too many cells, uh, but there's no real way to concentrate it if you have too few. Uh, the third problem with it is it is um, basically just going to give you biomass. How much cell stuff is there? The more cell stuff is there, the higher the reading will get. But um, like that doesn't necessarily translate to a number of cells because some bacterial cells might be long rods like this. And some bacterial cells might be small coxy, like this. Well, which one's going to refract light more? This one is. So the same number of cells from this are going to cause more turbidity than a number of cells from this. So it's not very useful for comparing one species of bacteria against a different species of bacteria. It's only really good if you're comparing within a single species and growth form. So if it has all these problems, why is it used so often? And the answer is because it's really, really fast and easy and cheap. Um, like for pretty much everything else, uh, at best, like it's gonna take you a couple of hours of work. And with this, you can just like check it super quick. And if you're growing bacteria, like you can't take an hour to go see how many bacteria you have because that's like a couple of generations of bacteria. So by the time you get the results, the number of bacteria has changed. If you want like real time, how are the bacteria that you're growing in lab doing? This is the fastest way to get it under most circumstances. You can also measure biomass by just taking your bacteria and just weighing them. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. Usually you would take your um, like tube of bacteria, right? And you put it in a centrifuge where it's going to be spun around in a circle really fast. And that's going to cause all of the cells to collect at the bottom. And then you pour out all of the liquid and just collect these cells. And then you weigh them. And you can either weigh them wet, which is the state in which they'll come. Um, and that's faster. Uh, but also less accurate, or you can put them into an oven, dry them totally out, and then measure their dry weight, which will give you a more accurate measure of how much biomass is there, but it takes a long time to dry them, and it is going to kill the cells. Uh, this is not frequently used because it is... 
again, it's not going to tell you how many cells are there. It's just going to tell you how much cell mass is there. Uh, but it is useful for organisms that are either filamentous, which means that you have your cells that actually grow really, really long, super long cells that have multiple genomes in them. So it's like one cell, but it's kind of one cell that could split into a whole bunch of cells really easily. Um, or you can use this for cells that really like to stick together tightly, like say biofilm forming cells or something like that, where you couldn't really get an accurate count of the number of cells by putting them on a plate and seeing what grew because you're just going to get one huge colony because all the cells are kind of stuck together. Uh, the, those are the, the main circumstances where you would want to measure biomass uh, through weighing them. Um, this is also just going to give you total cell mass, not living versus dead. Now, what if you can't separate out individual cells, but you only want to measure living cells? You can measure not the cells themselves, but stuff that the cells make. And there's a few ways to do this. This is detecting cell products. So cells can make, bacterial cells, depending upon what you feed them, can make acid, usually acid, occasionally base, but usually acid. Um, they can make gas, typically CO2, but occasionally oxygen. Um, and they can make ATP which is their standard energy molecule. Um, these are all things that under similar circumstances, the same species of bacteria should make at about the same rate. Um, so the more acid that is made, you assume that means that the more cells there are to make the acid. Similarly, the more gas that gets made, you assume that that means that there's more cells making the gas. The more ATP that is made, the more cells there are making ATP. The problem with this is that um, you have to be very, very careful to make sure that the cells that you are comparing are exactly the same. Because, so, uh, in the bacterial growth curve, you have, like, lag and then log and then uh, the stationary phase. Well, bacteria in lag phase or uh, in log phase versus bacteria in stationary phase actually make hugely different amounts of ATP, like tenfold different amounts of ATP. So you could have uh, a million of these, and it would look like 100,000 of these. So you have to make sure that you're comparing bacteria that are in the same stage in their life cycle um, and that are being fed exactly the same nutrients so that they're, they're at the same metabolic rate and things like that. But... For some bacteria, if you want to measure like how the bacteria are um, are changing in real time and you can't get a good turbidity measurement or turbidity is not accurate enough for you, you only want to look at living cells, well, this is the way you pretty much have to do it. And some of these methods work really, really well, but all of them are very finicky to get accurate results from, though there are some of the best ways to get really good results if you get them worked out. All right, so those are the main methods to detect and measure bacterial growth that I wanted to talk to you guys about. And please do the questions down below.